Hey, what's up? Jason here with Unity3D.College. Uh, today, I just kind of wanted to talk about some project architecture stuff again, and maybe a little bit on code cleanliness and just how I like to keep things. There was a little bit of a discussion yesterday on Reddit just about extension methods, and there's some different opinions, but I, I wasn't really swayed, and I just kind of wanted to explain why, I guess, and then jump into a couple other code things that I think are important and don't get talked about a lot, especially not in Unity forums where I'm around a lot. So like, if you don't know what extension methods are, I guess I'll just really briefly explain it. They're just a way to add on functionality to a sealed class. So like with the Vector3 that's built in, you know, it comes with Unity, you can't just go in and edit the class and add a new um, a new method there, right? But you can create a static class with some static methods that take the first parameter with this this keyword right here, and then they have to be of the same type that you want to extend, and then you can pass in whatever other parameters. What, what happens is when you have a vector three, then you can call it on an object and it gets passed in as original or whatever the name of this variable is and then just passes back out and does whatever. It can return back a vector three if you want, or like in this example, I just wanted a really simple one that just checks to see if the thing is behind me. So this is super simple functionality and I could have this just in the code, but I think it makes it a little bit easier to read if I just go in and, you know, if, if I'm looking here and it's doing a dot product check right here, it, it's a little bit harder to read than is behind, right? Like is behind, it's like, okay, if this thing is behind that or the distance is less than this. Like, I, I get that you can still you know, read this and understand it. Most people can, you know, if you're not, if you haven't done it before, you might not, and you might have to look it up. If you haven't done it before and this is somebody else's code base, this extension method tells you exactly what it's doing and it kind of could teach you how to do it as well. So I, I like them for that kind of cleanliness and just making it so that the code is really easy to read and easier to follow. Like another example, like I said, in this class, this project, I've only got a couple extension methods. So I don't just like to drop them all in and have, you know, an overload of extensions that I'm not using. I generally just put them in as I need them. So like this with one, right? Like here I'm just setting this indicator for a puck. It's just a hockey game. And I just set the position of the thing to its original position with the Y set to this ground Y, which right now is just hard coded at 0 0.1. Um, and, and I just find it slightly easier. I could also do, you know, like, uh, this. I, could, I could pass in new vector three puck transform like dot x comma ground y comma puck transform dot position dot c like I could do that as well but I just like the syntax better it's slightly cleaner it's oh it's not I wouldn't even say cleaner it's easier to tell what's going on it's slightly smaller and uh oh just a a preferencing like I said there's no functional difference here it's really just about making the code a tiny bit easier to read I think I got a couple other extension methods in here there's a oh direction to yeah this is one I think that was actually brought up there so of course it's just you know the destination minus the current position gets you the vector to there and then normalize it to get the direction but I like to just have a little direction to method in here so it's just a tiny bit easier to read and it avoids me making a mistake, right? Like I'm sure I'm not the only one who's accidentally put them in the wrong order when I'm coding fast and you know, coding you're thinking about a lot of things. The, the order of stuff gets mixed up sometimes and this kind of fixes it. It makes it really obvious like the direction to this. So it's always super simple and just spelling it out a little bit more. So yeah, I guess that's, kind of why I like extension methods. And um, th th I think the main arguments were that it was just kind of hiding stuff, which I guess I could see that if you don't know what the extension methods are doing, if you're just using them as 
a giant crutch and you're bringing in you know, libraries and libraries of extension methods that you don't really know what they are. Um, so like I said, in my projects, I tend to just bring them in or add them as I need them. So if I find myself doing something to a sealed class, you know, especially more than once, I'm probably going to turn it into an extension method. And in these cases, I'm only using them, I think, one or two times, but I plan to use them more as this project grows. It's super early state, which is actually, oh, let me see if I can pull this up. I actually need to pull in a new uh, art update. The artist has some stuff. I broke a lot of materials, but I was just waiting for him to, to give me the new stuff instead of just going in and fixing it. Um, so the, I guess the other thing I want to talk about was just code cleanliness in general just keeping things small and separated. I've written at least one blog post, probably more that I've forgotten by now, just about keeping the code as separated as possible and having you know tiny methods that do one thing and small classes that are responsible for one thing. Like, let me see. So like if you look at a character here, and these are still kind of rough, so you know, don't expect them to be perfect, but I think might maybe get across the idea a little bit. It's like I have a character here and I've got so far three scripts on here, four if you count the settings, it's actually a separate separate file. Um, but a lot of that, you know, I've seen a lot of projects where there's just one big monolithic script with you know, properties all the way down. Like some of them are so big you have to scroll down to see every field on there that you can edit, which you know, it makes it really brittle, kind of hard to deal with and hard to tell what the hell is going on, hard to tell what you're supposed to do. But I guess the, the brittleness is the biggest thing. It's a lot harder to change a big class because you really don't know what's gonna go wrong. And I guess like if I take a look at you know, this, like this character class, is already, in my opinion, too big. We're at 150, 148 lines, and there's gonna be other functionality that needs to be done by the character. So a lot of this stuff just needs to get split out. In fact, it should probably get reordered too. It's a big pet peeve of mine, and I did it myself, just keeping things not in the right order. Sometimes when I'm experimenting with stuff and trying to decide what I want to do. You know, the code gets a little messy and then I just gotta jump in the next day and clean it up. Oh, there's another one. It's like I like to keep all of the public properties up at the top, you know, behind the serialized fields and the private fields. Pretty much in the same order. Um, so let's see. Like I said, this one, oh man, so much stuff out of order here. Like I said, this one's not the best example, but like one thing I'd say is, you know, if you look at a big class with a lot of settings on it, you, know, you can definitely split some of this stuff out. Like you can take this character settings that I have. It, this is all of the settings for this character. There's not a whole lot hooked up yet. It's gonna be like, you know, how fast does this guy skate? How good is he at stealing the puck? How hard does he hit? You know, what are his fighting stats for when they get into a little hockey fight? And I keep it just in a separate class here. The serializable field, or attribute, I mean, that makes it so that it'll show up here so I can actually just have a settings section on my character. And then just slide this around. I may end up splitting this into a scriptable object later, but I think there's only gonna be six or so different characters, so it might not be worth it. Um, and I guess while I'm in here, just wanna show, like, some people might be wondering why the hell I have you know, a private field with a public you know property here that just reads this private field when I could you know theoretically cut this all down to public that equals 0 0.2 and then put a range on it right like I, I could oh, missing the type so I, I could do something like this right and cut the amount of code in half but I'm kind of feeling rambly here, but I guess the uh, the problem here is if you do that, then these settings, which I don't ever want to change from code, can be changed from code. Somebody could accidentally change this. It could be me, it could be somebody else, 
could just misunderstand or not realize what they're doing and accidentally change the settings here from from the code and they're not supposed to do it so i want to strictly enforce that this thing is private it's only meant to be edited in the inspector and you can only read it it's get only and i just yeah i like this format it keeps it clean and safe i've actually run into cases where there were settings on prefabs uh, and the, there were references to prefabs that were public there's code changing those references and then it was breaking the prefabs so you would play and it would literally just break your prefabs i think i have an example of how you can set that up and reproduce it yourself it's not too hard it just takes a little bit of accidentally using something wrong and here cleaning stuff up while i talk so I think the other thing I wanted to talk about was just splitting stuff up a little bit more. So like I said, I've got a character, I've got a character movement script. This one just handles the motion of this guy. Right now it actually also handles animation a little bit because I was using root motion animation. Um, right now it's, this project's kind of pulling away from that. So I'm gonna yank this stuff out probably later on today or sometime this week. So, it, so it'll just handle movement and not do, it, do the animation stuff anymore. I just like to have these classes that just do a small single responsibility. It's not, the character doesn't care about its movement at all. In fact, the character doesn't know anything about movement. That's all done through the state machine here that's on each character. So each character has a, right now it's a badly named one. It's called bot player. This should be like a brain and I'll probably refactor that today too. So it's got a little default brain here. Just rename this to brain afterwards. And it takes in a state, so you can set a state on it. Um, whenever the owner of the puck is changed, right now it just changes to different states. So it just sets it to a new state. It's not super memory efficient, but this isn't for mobile and it doesn't matter, so I haven't optimized it yet. So I would just check and set a state but then the way it works is in the update. So this bot player script, which I think you can see on the character here. All right, go to the character, got this script here. Like I said, it should be a brain, I'll change it. Uh -huh. So what it does is just in the update, it just ticks whatever the current state is. So as I'm playing, or as the bots are playing, the current state will just tick. And the current state, like I said, it's just an abstract class. So you can't instantiate this, but you can have subclasses off of it. I have, what do we have here now? Five different states? Is there five different, um, yeah, no. It's got seven, cool. So we got seven different states here. So like they start off in an idle state. When they go in, they do nothing. When they leave the state, they do nothing. They stop all movement every frame. So if they happen to be moving, they'll stop. And then they just look at the puck. So this is like when they're standing there just waiting for the game to start. They'll probably eventually play some random idle animations and do other stuff. All right, and then we'll go into like a chase puck state, which just looks to see if the puck is in front of them, then it'll move towards them. If they can, If their character can try to steal it, the character will try to steal it. And then these things like the character might be wondering how, how do you get this into the state? Because these are not mono behaviors. There's no reference or no way to really get a reference to the character because this isn't, you can't do like a get component because this isn't on an object. So these are, like I said, just passed in in the constructor of the state. So I just pass in right now the, the bot player, which again will be a brain. Just pass that in and then grab the components that I need and then cache them here. So this makes it kind of easy to just flow through the different states and I guess the last thing I'll show is like I've to make it even easier to tell what's going on I added a simple state visualizer that's just a big style here so this thing this class just puts a little text there that shows me in the editor what's going on so I think I got rid of this stuff too so here I just go through and find all of the players and then I loop through them all and then I put a label there that has their the two string value of their brain, which right here is just, as you can see, the state or default to none. So like when, I, when they're playing, I think I've only got one guy enabled right now, messing with changing out animations. 
So you can see he's in that move to point state. He skates over there. There he goes. Where's he going? I don't know where he's going. Yeah, it's somewhat broken. He's messing with stuff. So now he's ch in that chase puck state. He got the puck. Now he's in the offense state. So offense state just tells him to go towards there. I shot it, and he's going back for the puck. There's no uh, no stopping after they score, I guess. I can't remember where I left off last night. So you can see he just keeps switching state, going back to the puck, going back to the offense state. And then I guess w what that helps with is just instead of having a big giant character class that has a whole bunch of things in there, if I want to add a new state, like I want him to be stunned, I can just add a stunned state, switch him to a stunned state. He stays stunned, plays whatever animations and sounds he needs to play, and then he's done. You can switch back into the next state. So it, it makes it really, really easy to extend things and uh, makes me feel safe. I'm not going to break things just by adding a new state. I mean, I might temporarily break things by putting him into a bad state that just doesn't work. But I'm not going to break my code base and have to go back and start reverting a bunch of stuff because I broke the character in some if statement, you know, halfway down a 500 line class or 1,000 line class. So I don't know if this is helpful to anybody. It's just kind of, like I said, me ranting and talking a little bit about how I like to hook things up and why I like to hook them up these ways. He said, I've run into a bunch of bad stuff throughout my career. Uh, yeah, and plenty of good stuff, too. It's not like it's all been bad. But I've seen plenty of 10,000, 20,000 line classes. And the worst case was like a 10,000 line method. Just a single method that was 10,000 lines to handle changing equipment. Like a six-month refactor job just to clean up one method. And that's the kind of mess that's made me want to keep everything super super separated um i think if you want to learn more about just single responsibility principle or you know, just clean code in general there's a couple of really great books there's the clean code and code complete definitely recommend those to anybody if you haven't checked them out like just read through them at least like the first what is it three or four chapters of clean code just very minimum just read that it'll it'll make your code better almost automatically just just from going through that you'll see how how much of a difference it can make and, and how much easier the code gets to read which is usually the most important thing you know like performance is important but way more important is your code readability performance is almost never bad because the code is readable and performance is usually bad because there's a problem somewhere that you can pick up in the profiler and fix. It's very rare that it's because the code is too split up or too clean. So you can have clean code and good performance. Uh, I think that's it. I'm, I've been rambling for like 15, 20 minutes now, so I'm gonna cut it off here. But I guess if you have any questions about this stuff, you know, like I said, always feel free to shoot me an email hop on the site, drop a comment on one of the posts. I try to reply to them all. And, um, or just drop a comment in the, the video below. All right, um, that's all I got for now. So thanks for watching and uh, 